Can everybody hear me? Great. Well, thank you all for coming. How many of you have been to the museum before? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so my name is Rachel Donaldson. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions here. And this is our third installment of what we call our Work Matters series. How many of you have come to any of the other Work Matters? Oh, good, good, good. good. Oh, we have the next one. We'll have everyone raise their hand. <laughs> um, but this is a new program that we've started where we're exploring the past, present, and future of work in our city and beyond. And um, this is made possible by the generous financial support of the Mary Jean and Oliver Trappers Foundation, um, and also our members. Um, so uh, before, it was, uh, just to give you kind of, I guess, a heads up of what, how this program is going to operate today, I'm going to begin by talking to you a little bit of a historical overview of labor conditions in the baking industry in the 19th century. And then we're going to invite a contemporary baker, um, Keeler Kyle, to come up and talk to us about what does it mean to be a baker today? And what is the baking landscape like in Baltimore specifically? So I wanna begin actually with a question. How many, or has anybody here ever watched The Gilded Age? Okay, a couple people, a couple people. Good, good. Um, it, it, it's a kind of complicated show. The reason why I bring this up is because this is one of the only pop culture examples that I can think of in, in recent memory that actually deals with in a really important facet of the labor movement in the late 19th century. And that was the eight hour movement. So if you think about labor activism in the 19th century, yes, we're going to push, what was that? <laughs> Workers are pushing for better, uh, higher wages, better working conditions, but really it's a push for a shorter workday. Um, and workers average the average workday for an industrial worker was anything from 14 to 15 hours a day. And the idea of an eight-hour workday was first adopted by an umbrella labor union called the National Labor Union that formed here in Baltimore in 1866. And so I bring up the Gilded Age because it's the one that actually shows this and really gets into the slogan of the eight hour movement, which was eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for what we will. And it's really that last part, the for what we will, that is so critically important. Because when you have workers working 14, 15 hours a day, all they're doing is sleeping, working, sleeping, working. They have no opportunity to be human to enjoy their families, to become educated, to engage in recreation. And so that's why that, that last part, the eight hours for what we will is, is so critical. Um, workers are going to get the eight hour <laughs> workday with the rise of the New Deal, um, particularly with the National Industrial Recovery Act of, of 1933 that is then really codified in the um, National Labor Relations Act of 1935. But there's a big gap in between. The reason why I bring this up is because states and the federal government in the late 19th century start passing patchwork laws, um, limiting the number of hours for different sectors of workers. And one of these laws, the law passed in New York State that was called the Bake Shop Act, that was passed in 1895, where New York State limited the number of hours for bakers to 10 hours a day, 60 hours a week. Not eight hours, but it's an improvement. Well, one baker in Utica, New York, named Joseph Lochner, was uh, fined twice for violating this law by having his workers work over 60 hours a week. He appealed his case all the way up to the Supreme Court in a case called Lochner versus New York. If any of you have taken an introduction to constitutional law class, you would have come across this law. It's or this case. It's so important for constitutional law and also for, for labor law. Because in a five to four decision in 1905, the Supreme Court declared that the Bake Shop Act was indeed unconstitutional. They found that it violated the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. If anybody has questions about this, I'd be happy to talk about that answer. Um, but they're like, no, yes, it's, it's limiting bakers' freedom of contract, essentially. But then there's a second part to it, where they said that the law failed what was known as the rational basis test. And they're just basically like, this law doesn't need to exist because you know what? Baking isn't all that hard. So there was no <laughs> rational basis for this law. 
When I first learned about this in an introduction to constitutional law class, my professor opened with the question of, have any of you worked in a bakery? Mm -hmm. To kind of really set the stage for, did the Supreme Court get it? And they didn't. Exactly. Um, so what I want to do is have this as a backdrop for what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of, of my particular time with you in this segment, so we can really understand what were the conditions um, for bakers? Why did you need laws like this Bake Shop Act? So first, let's get into hours. The average workday for bakers um, from Monday through Friday was about 16 hours. Okay, a little bit higher than the average, but not terrible. But then it went up to 23 hours on Saturday and five hours on Sunday. So we're talking over a 90 hour work week for which they earned an average weekly wage of $8 and 20 cents. Um, and so the hours were excruciating because they were unregulated in this business. Um, and this is something that again, why you have bakers so much a part of this, this eight hour movement because this is what they were facing. But there are other conditions about the baking industry that were kind of unique um, to this industry as opposed to others. So if you think about the late 19th century, really beginning in the 1870s, this is what's known as the second industrial revolution. This is the time when you have the massive growth of industries and corporations. And because, as the part and parcel of this, the gap between employers and employees becomes a chasm. Prior to the, even the first industrial revolution, employer employees, their interests were kind of mutually aligned. That is not the case by this point, which you'll also see in the Gilded Age. <laughs> Watch it. Um, but you have, again, this situation where employers have no idea what it's actually like for their employees on the job. Not so in the baking industry. When you think about like big industrial baking, that's not going to come until the, um, the rest of the 20th century. Most baking, pretty much all baking in urban areas in the 19th century, not just the 1920s, is really kind of these small mom and pop shops um, where the baking was done in cellars. Um, and, and so you have the cellar bakeries, the store where they're sold, and oftentimes on top was where the baker and his, uh, master baker and his family lived. Another thing so that's uh, kind of different about this is that you don't have this kind of massive expansion and scaling up of this industry. You also have a much closer relationship between employers and employees. Um, in fact, the baking industry still was really reminiscent of the guild system of the pre-industrial era. The person who owned and operated the bakery was called a master baker. And the per people who worked for him were called journeymen, which again is the same terminology. If you think about an apprentice, journeyman, master, the same thing that is happening here. Um, and so it is a very much a small operation, um, very kind of closely tied between the, the journeyman bakers and um, the master baker. But it's the journeyman bakers that I'm really focusing on for this, um, for this talk. Um, and then again, that's what they call themselves as well. So they're working these incredibly long hours. And something else that is unique to this industry is that their workplaces were also places where they lived. If you're working 92 hours <laughs> a week, these people are also sleeping in the cellar bakeries. And this is where things get particularly exploitative and problematic. Um, because the master bakers could work, wake up the baker, the, the journeyman, at any point, you know, because they were they're sleeping there. Um, and indeed they would. In fact, according to um, the a testimony and to the investigation about its baking conditions in New York City, um, a journeyman baker reported that a master baker he worked for would set a torch on fire and burn the bottoms of the feet of the journeyman bakers in order to wake them up and get them back to work. But let's talk about these spaces. What were these cellar base, uh, bakeries like? Well, they were tiny. They were cramped. Usually about seven feet high was the, the highest uh, ceiling level. Um, they were, of course, filled with fumes. You have coal ash. You have like the gas jet fumes and the like. They were also, again, very unsanitary. Um, according to an uh, uh, investigation in 1892 into uh, working conditions in uh, New York City bakeries, um, the invest inspector found in one that he was uh, uh, there was leaking sewage into a fermentation cup. In another, a broken sink had turned the floor into a marshy swamp, and the smell was so bad he was forced out of it. 
And in the third, he was also forced out by a swarm of cockroaches the size of grasshoppers. Um, and so again, so you kind of think, oh, you know, the Supreme Court did have access to this knowledge, but that's the here in So these are the kinds of conditions that they're living in. Um, according to another journeyman baker, he was forced to sleep on a heap of rags, and I quote, upon which a ray of sun had not shown in years, and the washing of which no one ever thinks. And he was lucky because others had to sleep only on sacks of flour for their bedding. Um, and we know this because of an investigation again of 505 journeyman breakers in New York City, 400 of whom testified that they uh, were had to sleep on the premises of the bakeries. Um, and this is something that labor reformers are pointing out again through these um, investigations and the like, but it's not just them. Um, according to a, a medical inspector in London who wrote a piece in the scientific journal about the conditions of bakers, he said, you know, the hard labor, um, the physical labor of it, the excessively long hours, the fact that they would, could only, the, you know, working in temperatures, and living in temperatures of anywhere from 100 to 110 degrees, where they could only cool themselves off by going outside in the winter, um, these, you know, led uh, all to premature aging of bakers. And according to another dream in Baker, he says it's no wonder why under these conditions you have high rates of alcoholism and suicide um, among the among the dream in Baker. Another um, testified that one of his, his co-workers died and was carted off on a regular common car after working a 36-hour shift. So again, these are the conditions that the bakers are, are dealing with in these in these small cellar shops. There was another aspect of what journeyman baker. So remember when I said that 505 out of the 505 people interviewed 400, and that's because uh, worked in, uh, lived in uh, where they worked, and that's because another pool of the journey, journeyman bakers were called were itinerant workers, where they didn't have one particular master baker that they were employed with. And there's another kind of interesting part about this industry that goes along hand in hand with these itinerant workers. In the fact that they often lived in boarding houses that were on the upper floors of saloons. If any of you have not seen our, uh, our new saloon exhibit, I highly recommend it. Um, one of the things that we point out in that is that you had saloons in the 19th century that were associated with different occupations. So you would have like a saloon for stevedores, you would have a saloon for steel workers. And of course, you had saloons that specifically cater to bakers. Um, and so this, again, why we would have this um, uh, you know, room and board, essentially, upstairs from these, these saloons. Well, these saloons became essentially labor contractors, with the saloon operators working in close uh, connection with the master bakers. So if a master baker needed somebody to come and take a job, he would go to the saloon operator and um, and get a name of somebody. Well, the people who the saloon operator would recommend were not the best, but the ones who were most in debt. Because what he could then do would garnish their wages for whatever debt that they had accrued. Because of course, you were still paying room and board. Oh, and the, the um, bakers, the journeymen who were living in the bakery, they were also charged room and board. Um, so the um, men had to work off, and again, it was very much a male dominated industry. Um, so these journeyman bakers had, would have to pay off their debts to the saloon owners. Um, and these conditions, I've been using examples again from New York City largely, but investigations in Maryland show that there are similar conditions were happening here. Um, and so in Maryland, which I'll get into a second, there was, of course, when we get to the rise of the Bakers Union, the Bakers Union local in Maryland was strongly prohibitionist and really a strong advocates of the anti-saloon movement because they wanted to get the hiring outside of these saloons and into union halls. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, if you read records of like and, uh, uh, prohibition unions <laughs> in the late 19th century, the, the Baker's Union, it, you know, really rises up the ranks. Um, so like other workers of this time, in order to address these conditions, they, they did like obviously formed unions. And the first Bakers and Confectionery Workers Union formed in 1881. Um, and this is, comes out of, there's a, a strike that happened in New York City, it was kind of failed, um, but out of this, they're like, we need to organize. And they have their first founding convention in Pittsburgh. Um, and you have uh, uh, several uh, you know, conventions thereafter, you have a local in Baltimore as well. Um, and it's also called the Journeyman. So it's the Bakers and Confectionery Workers International Union of America. <laughs> it's the full title. 
title. Um, but their masthead of their um, uh, newspaper also says it was specifically for journeymen. The union reflected the ethnic makeup of this industry, which was heavily German. And in fact, basically all the delegates are here. We have here the, the Baker's Journal. Um, when it was actually printed in English, because for much of the 19th century, up until the early 20th century, it was only printed in German. Um, again, kind of reflecting this. Um, the local in Maryland would meet at the Mechanics Hall, which was a really important site for labor organizing in the late 19th century that unfortunately burned down in the 1904 fire. Um, but this, uh, uh, this union that formed still exists today. It has gone through several mergers, but we now have the bakery, confectionery, uh, okay, let me, bakery, confectionery, tobacco, and grain millers union. <laughs> um, and the headquarters for the international is here in Montgomery County. Um, and we, of course, have a local in Baltimore as well. Um, so thanks to uh, the uh, union, you have the union really kind of again pushing for improved conditions. So the things that they really wanted to end were things like night work, um, particularly those overnight work um, on, because uh, it wasn't like people working shifts, it was like one person at a time, everyone was working um, for this, so they wanted to end that. Um, and so they pushed, pushed uh, action on the legislative level. They also took their message directly to consumers. Has anyone here read The Jungle? I'm familiar with The Jungle. Okay, what industry does Upton Sinclair target? Meat packing, exactly. And so this is a work of fiction, but it's based on his own kind of investigative journalism into the meat packing industry. And so he's describing these horrible work conditions. Um, and it's like there's this one scene where everybody remembers the sausage scene <laughs> where it's like, you know, dead rats and they throw the rats and the rat poison and everything goes in the, you know, the sausage hopper. And so again, his aim was to generate labor reform. But instead, people were like, oh my God, we're eating this. Um, and so this actually led to the rise of sanitation laws and the formation of the FDA. Well, taking a cue from that, the Bankers Union brings again their message directly to consumers to be like, hey, these really unsanitary bakeries, you're eating the products that are coming out of this. And so they pointed out that the men who worked there had no wash basins for themselves. They couldn't wash their cans. They couldn't clean themselves and the like. Um, so again, taking this like hot upper level of trying to get directly to legislators and also to consumers to try to change public opinion. Um, eventually, as I said, you have, um, and with the um, New Deal in 1933, the National Industrial Recovery Act, you have the formation of codes, the first codes for the industry, um, where bakers get together and they're like, here's how we will basically self-regulate. The Supreme Court declared that unconstitutional, um, but the forces of the New Deal regrouped in 1935 and have the National Labor Relations Act that established these codes industry-wide. So thanks to labor laws, um, improved labor laws, and so the work of the union, we have a vastly different landscape of um, baking today. So now I want to shift from the dark times <laughs> to, and I want to invite here, Kiela Kyle, who is the owner and operator of Ovenford Bakery um, here in Baltimore, to the state Yeah, So what we're going to do is I have a few questions. Um, and then what I'd love to do is open up the questions for you. So if you have any questions about the historical information that I provided, or especially questions for Keeler about his work, um, please, please do so. So to get the ball rolling, thank you so much for coming. I'm very happy, Peter. Thanks, everyone. I was not expecting so many people to come, but <laughs> like, this is what bakeries do. They bring people together. <laughs> exactly. Oh, and I also wanted to make a note that um, uh, Keeler has graciously provided us some samples of his amazing page goods. So make sure to stay afterwards and, and <laughs> have, have some of that. Um, so uh, Keeler, you have a really interesting story of how you became a baker. Would you mind telling us? Yeah, uh, not, a, not at all. Um, my, uh, my background is, is kind of varied. I'm, I'm not a traditional baker. I didn't go to um, culinary school or anything. I um, grew up on a farm in upstate New York. I was a dairy farming family. We could talk about labor law for for dairy farming as well. Um, it's pretty pretty parallel with, with things in the vaping industry. But um, I also was trained as a conservation biologist and worked a lot with bird, birds uh, internationally and nationally uh, before this. Um, more recently worked as uh, worked 
cleaning up water quality in the Chesapeake Bay for the, the Nature Conservancy here in Maryland uh, when we finally moved here. Um, and then decided to start baking it out of the house. So I, I was basically a run the entire cottage industry, starting out of my house, everything by hand, small batch, everything to starting a small uh, brick and mortar corner shop in Little Italy, uh, which now has just um, opened its door I, after three and a half years of being in that small row house baking, which we were not in the basement, although we did some work in the basement. Uh, we were in the first floor, and thank God I did not live above the bakery. Oh my God, people were asking if I was going to live above the bakery. No, I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm going to do that for the exact reason it's like any time of day I'm going to have to be here. Um, to, we just opened a, a new facility in, in Highland Town uh, that's uh, 10 times the size of, of a row house. Basically, we're at 9,000 square feet now for the facility and, and uh, retail. So um, we, our bakery's been growing very quickly, um, mainly to make room for bread um, and also the, the pastries that we're making. But um, it, we'll, we'll talk also about the, how invigorated the city is to, to see kind of this heritage of, of baking, I think, come back. Um, it's it's kind of had a lull for a little while, and um, I think it's kind of making a comeback right now. That's great. So yeah, it's a very, very, very story, um, but uh, it all started with me baking out of the house um, before COVID, mainly out of out of uh, inspiration from the Great British Bake Off. I was kind of watching that. <laughs> and you started with sourdough, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, we started in, um, I started uh, first making lemon poppy seed uh, cakes and then decided that uh, baking bread was something I was really intimidated by and, and made, a, made a go of it at home. My wife being Turkish has basically said since we got together that bread in the United States is just just not good. <laughs> and so I was inspired also to be like, hey, let's try to make some good bread for us out of the house. And, and uh, with her continued encouragement and lots of lots of friends and friends of friends and then strangers <laughs> continuing to encourage me to, to keep working with, with bread. Eventually it was sourdough in 2017. I, the starter, the sourdough starter we use now uh, was started in my house uh, next to Patterson Park. So we, we get to call this a, a Baltimore sourdough. It's you know, San Francisco be damned. Um, <laughs> they're not the only ones that can do sourdough bread. We, we can do sourdough bread here pretty well too. Um, but that, that starter um, has been the generator of, of all of my bread for what now, bread six, six, almost six or seven years. That's great. So could you describe to us a typical work day um, for, now I know that you're kind of more in the running of the operations, but for, for you, for your bakers. Uh, yeah, I'll start with the bakers. I think they have a, a little bit easier go um, than me right now. I'll, I'll explain why in a second. But um, going back to the eight-hour workday, um, because we, we do a sourdough-based um, baking um, program, a lot of what we do takes a lot of time. The sourdough takes longer than a, a yeasted bread. Um, for instance, we were we were starting to mix our bread today around 7 a.m. Um, that is not going to uh, be baked until about 12 tonight. Um, and before that, it basically had roughly about a, it has about a 32 hour lifespan um, from the point that the starter sped to the point that it's mixed and baked and in your hands. It's it's a uh, the process in, is all elongated, uh, very similar, I think, to how some of the, the breads might have been made back. Um, at the turn of the century, uh, yeast had not been isolated yet so much, uh, at least commercial yeast, they were using a lot of old dough, vegas and foolishes and things that like they would just kind of throw into the mix to just help fermentation occur. Um, and basically the whole thing is trying to speed, speed up the process. But I think also the days get very long because we kind of have to wait for this other animal, this other, this other thing to uh, raise your dough and then the baking has to take a certain amount of time. There's no, there's no way to get around baking bread. You can't speed it up, otherwise it gets burned. You can't, you know, you don't have to, obviously you don't want to slow it down. So the days get very long. Um, our, our bread team specifically is uh, running um, 10 hour days, uh, four days a week. So going back to that 40 hour work week, um, it's conducive to having um, individual bakers uh, stay in the bakery for 10 hours so they can see the bread through the entire process. Um, and that's actually how they prefer to do it. So that gives them an extra day to kind of recover and have the at will uh, time period of their actual weekend. They have a day of sleep and then two days of actually. Um, we run um, 
multiple shifts running almost 24 hours a day at this point. Uh, we start in the morning. We have a team that runs throughout the day, daylight hours. Um, we have a quick two hour break and then our evening team comes in to bake uh, starting at 7 p.m. So they're literally there right now, um, starting to bake bread and pastries. Then that shift will go till about 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, so, it, and it, it overlaps. So there's people coming in and then leaving earlier and then others coming a little bit later and staying a little later. So everyone's running about an eight hour day, um, six to eight hour days, so we'll call it overnight. Um, and going back to labor law, I, I um, on principle, feel like people should be getting like night night sleep hours. And so we actually are kind of artificially or arbitrarily, because it's my decision, stop the bake at 4 a.m. so that people can get home and actually hopefully get some nighttime sleep, um, even if it's a short period of time, um, because I don't, the graveyard shift where you essentially start in the night and, you know, watch the sun come up and try to make that work seems absolutely crazy to me. So. <laughs> So we have teams. We have teams working in various times of day. Um, I, as the owner and actually one of the bakers, uh, kind of insert myself wherever I'm needed. So I sometimes I have pulled a 36-hour shift. It's absolutely horrible, and I, yeah, I would not wish that on anyone. Um, I did that like two times in a row. Like after a few days, like a few days in between, and just, um, so I. Yeah, I would I would also join a union at that point. So one of the things that um I didn't really get to talk about the like intensity of the labor of yeah. baking. So I was wondering from your firsthand experience if you could talk about like do you consider baking to be labor intensive? Absolutely. I mean, no no question whatsoever. Um it's it certainly is it's um changed, but uh, but baking baking is still baking. Like that unfortunately and unfortunately I think there's a rich heritage in baking. Um, but when you're moving heavy dough around, I mean, we're, we're still, I, I very much consider ourselves an incredibly small bakery. We're an artisan bread bakery. We do everything by hand. However, we still use machinery to, to mix our doughs. And, you know, the, the mixers at this point in our larger facility allow us to mix upwards of 450 pounds of dough at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, that's all again, going into bread, um, for us and, um, and so somehow you have to get 450 pounds of dough. We're not we're not quite there yet. We're more at like 120 pounds of dough right now. But um, you know you have to get that 120 pounds out of that machine and into some sort of container that will then um, go through its its bulk fermentation for five to six hours. And so it's not only do you have to get it out of the machine, but then you have to go and do your stretch and folds of all of that weight. Um, and then you have to move that around the bakery because like it doesn't always get to stay in the same place. And you you have carts and you have wheels and all sorts of stuff, but it's still there's still heavy lifting involved. Um, we have just recently gone from you know hand shaping 300 bagels a day um, to using a, a 1988 West German made uh, dough divider and rounder, so something that will cut the dough into equal parts and actually round the dough. It's, it's a machine that literally. Is almost as old as I am, not quite, but almost as old as I am, doing the exact same thing since that period of time. But it has absolutely relieved the tension, literally in people's arms, as they would have to sit there on the table and roll out individual pieces of dough to then become our bagels. And we make great, I think we make great bagels, but like there's a lot of labor intensity that goes into that, a lot of intensiveness of, of labor. Um, and then you have to do that over and over. So that's the other part too. Is Bread only lasts so long, and so you don't get to uh, have an elongated lifespan of that product. Um, so you have to do that every day mm -hmm. and do that every week. And so that's that's where I think it really starts to wear on people. It's not necessarily any individual act, but it's it's also a lot of effort. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're having this conversation in conjunction with um, our gallery that we recently refreshed on um, bakeries in Baltimore. And one of the things that we um, point out in this interpretation of the gallery is that there was a shift among smaller independent bakeries um, from bread baking um, to more pastries and cakes and like because bread became more the domain of grocery stores. Yeah. In, mostly like in the mid 20th century. Do you see a shift going back? And what do you, if so, what do you think is prompting this? Yeah, I, um, I, I think there's been I talked to my dad about a lot about this too because he he worked at a lot of corner shops. He's he's a, in his mid seventies now, and he grew up in the fifties, 
and 60s um, and worked in a lot of these corner shops. And I think what's what essentially happened is as the mechanism, the mechanization of, of that bread production occurred um, and made everybody's life quote unquote easier, I think we also cut a lot of corners in terms of overall the, the health of that bread uh, for our bodies themselves. But like, again, I go back to, okay, we need to make bread and it doesn't have a very long shelf life. Okay, what can we add to prolong that shelf life? We'll make that, you know, we'll get that that dollar, maybe not today, but not tomorrow, it's the third day. Um, whereas our bread only lasts a day or two on the shelf um, before we start to do other things with it. Um, and so there's there's preservatives being added to bread. The, the process to speed up the, the fermentation um, basically um, reduces the amount of uh, breakdown that's, a, that's occurring um, within the bread itself. So it's actually harder for our, our bodies to digest both because of the preservatives and the speed at which it's being fermented. Um, the invention of, and, and the concentration of commercial yeast um, basically made the, the fermentation process of one trick pony. So basically it's just how much air, how much carbon dioxide can we get into the dough, not how much gluten break down, how much uh, complex carbohydrate can we break down um, to make it easier for our body to uh, digest. So I feel like the bread has kind of started to cut a lot of corners to a point where it kind of lost what it used to taste like in terms of, of complex flavors. Um, just the digestibility of these things. That's why we have a rise in a lot of gluten intolerance, in my opinion, um, where uh, if you go back to slightly longer longer fermentation times, um, a lot of the things that, that people, I think, uh, are missing are just kind of all in that jumbled into that, that pro it's a process thing rather than, because the ingredients are exactly the same. We're putting four ingredients into a, into a, a bread loaf, just the same as you would in, you know, in a grocery store loaf. Um, they may add a few extra things, but like that's part and parcel basically what, what's in ours versus theirs. It's all about processing and how much time we're giving the community of of, um, of the natural starter a chance to uh, do its job uh, within the dough itself, break things down, create more flavor, and actually um, change the pH of that dough so we actually get natural uh, preservation um, the longer we can ferment it. So the sour, more sour dough, the more sour your dough is, the longer it will sit on the shelf. So that's, that's another thing too that we've noticed. Uh, so our sourdoughs will go seven, possibly seven to 10 days um, on, on your counter um, without any preservatives, just based on a pH change. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what are some of the challenges that you face as, as a baker, particularly going from you know being a home baker to yeah. uh, now baking for consumers? Um, and are these challenges like specific to Baltimore? Or do you think that there's kind of like, you know, industry wide? Um, I think, I think uh, that our, my biggest challenge was figuring out how to take what I was doing at home, making one, two perfect loaves at a time out of my, out of my oven um, to how do I start to build, both build and meet demand. Um, and so that, that takes a lot of different types of logistics that include a lot of labor changes, right? It's not just, can't just be me anymore if we're going to try to scale this up. Uh, we need larger ovens, we need larger equipment, we need more of this, more of that, um, but we also need more people <laughs> because it's gonna take uh, more than just myself, unfortunately, to um, to do all of this. So all of those are complications and, and more complexities. Um, I think um, as we've now reached about 30 employees in our, our, our company in about, as I said, three and a half years, um, it's it's kind of managing all of those people uh, when it comes to being a part of this process. It, it goes from who's getting all of our deliveries in of, of just our flour and putting it in the right place to the bakers who are taking that flour and actually mixing the dough, to the bakers that are baking that that into bread, to the people that are going to in the morning be able to collect that and sell it to somebody. Um, let alone now we have three locations in the city, Lexington Market, Little Italy, and in Highland Town. So now we have the drive to drive everything um, to all these different places. It's 10 minutes down the road, but we're moving a lot of stuff. So yes. it's, it's someone's got to be able to drive a van um, every week. Um, and so, you know, labor, labor it takes on a lot of different 
um, takes, and I, I'm, I'm kind of focusing my attention on bread, but we also do an entire um, pastry program as well. So all of those are moving and, and moving through the bakery at different times during the day, both day and night. So they all have to line up at the right time too. So when, when we need to deliver something, bread, pastry, all have to come back together and then be put on the shelf and then sold in various, in various ways and then managed that stock needs to be managed. Um, I think I think that ultimately um, uh, people certainly are a hard a hard part of this. <laughs> have, to, have to be honest, um, because when you have thirty people, um, and I, I am a very compassionate person. Everyone has something happening occasionally, and so when you have thirty people who have everyone is having something happen occasionally, it's now happening something happening all the time. So <laughs> you have to keep up with that part of it too. But, um, so far, we've, we've done that relatively successfully, I, I would say. Um, and, I, and I do think that there's there's a growing a growing interest um, in kind of artisan products in general. And I think that um, that bakeries uh, are about to come full circle. We've we've seen a lot of new new bakeries uh, coming into Baltimore um, that are all kind of struggling with this kind of same growth. Um, Effort and they're they're doing it in very different ways. It's actually quite fascinating. Some people are staying very small. Mati Bread um, in Charles Village is somebody who is a very accomplished baker, and he's kept his team very small, and he's been able to manage manage things that way. Um, Meyer um, Bakery is a, a pastry bakery that's that's growing very quickly. She's amazing, um, and she's just taking over, you know, Gramble Baking. Co's space, which have, has kind of gone out because they were not able to kind of manage uh, a lot of things. And I think the owner was very tired. Mm -hmm. And I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's, you know, if my ending my question portion on, on another note, what, because you've had such an interesting career path. And I think it's really kind of inspiring to people, you know, that, that you can go start out in one direction and then go completely somewhere completely different. Um, what do you find was rewarding? About bacon, I I um I've definitely found uh, again going back to the process. What what are we missing in, in the baking world? I think to me, like the process is the most fascinating um, when it comes to again taking very basic ingredients that one we were we were actually making on our farm. Uh, you know, we were growing wheat that would go to mills. Uh, we would feed it to cows, or if it was good enough quality, we would sell it to mills for human consumption. So taking something that I know how to grow and then turning that into something that is, you know, a product that I absolutely love. I mean, I love bread. It's like, I mean, that is my jam. Bagels are like the thing I'll eat every day um, if I have time. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, I just, I'm seeing, I'm seeing this whole thing through. Um, and I think it's been, um, I'm calling it deep. I call it deeply satisfying. I don't. I'm not ecstatic. I'm not like overly pleased. I'm. I'm not over the moon. I am just like deeply satisfied to see this come to fruition. Um, it's and, and maybe yeah, there's some other business owners in the crowd too, and maybe understand that because like it's it's uh it's a it's a weird type of reward that you get when you when you try to build something that you that you are really really deeply committed to. I'll leave. Thank you. Well, now I want to turn it to you all. Who has a question? Oh, good. So are you in the front and then you're right, right behind? I'm so sorry. I'm really you. Do. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's definitely complicating. Um, that we, you know, uh, have to say like, hey, we've got an opening in a night shift, and I'm like, dear God, do I, I do not want to have to work on a night shift? And the people are like, yeah, I'll take night shift. I love night shift. I'm like. Excellent. But, you know how to bake bread? I didn't ask that question yet, but you're you're okay to work night shift. Teach you. Um, we have actually, honestly, been very lucky, um, it, and I know that because I've heard other um, folks in the food industry in general, whether it be restaurants or food production spaces, having a hard time finding quality people. I honestly have been very lucky. I think mainly because. We have a relatively slow turnover, I think, as in the industry goes. Um, uh, again, we go back to just working conditions. I'm, I'm really trying to focus on those, um, where we are able to be pretty selective around um, uh, when we do have an opening, we kind of have an idea of who we might want to 
bill um, because we had people approach us who are very high quality people. Um, and I, we keep the team relatively small, so we don't always have to be filling multiple positions at the same time. So we we get to be a little bit more choosy, I think. Ma'am, so I have two questions. So I let you know if I can ask two, or if I have to choose, then I'll ask. Go for it. <laughs> so I actually took notes, and I hope this was right. But I'm really curious. You said that um, so Brad has certain, you know, livability, and then. Uh, after a day or two, you start doing other things. Like there are other things yep. to do with the with the bread after a day or two. Yeah, sure. What what is it, and how do you recycle or reuse the bread? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So um, we I know that bread is good well beyond when I'm willing and capable of selling a loaf of bread on the stand, if you will. So you know, I I we we bake fresh every day. And we have bread that's a day old um, that's that's sold. And, and after that, it, it's removed from our shelves and it goes a, a few different places. So uh, we can um, uh, slice that bread down and, and freezing sourdough bread is actually one of the things that I think that's almost, almost have to remind people that that you can actually do this. It's it's mm -hmm. it's wonderful. It's it does not act like a supermarket bread when in the freezer. Like it comes back to life beautifully. And what we'll end up doing is kind of stopping any sort of um, scaling process or breakdown process um, by using the freezer. I will slice this bread and possibly use it for sandwiches. Um, so that's one thing I was also going to mention too is that where um, bakeries have kind of just gotten away with doing fresh bread every day, fresh bread every day, um, and just being the bakery, um, what we've been able to do is kind of link um, the bread baking with kind of a, a sandwich deli based system. So we we find other value added ways to move fresh bread into other 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 things like sliced bread. You know, oh, slice the bread and we make something else. Um, we also can uh, take, for instance, uh, bagels that are getting older, older, two days old, and actually slice those down and start, we're starting to make bagel chips out of those. So we can toast those down, make croutons uh, with bread, make bagel chips with the bagels themselves. Um, if we're, we're working on getting more and more, uh, we'll call it, up, up, I call it upcycle, because basically we're kind of elevating it further uh, through through extra effort and, and time uh, from our team to make it into something else really kind of interesting. Um, uh, we also have been donating all of our bread through the, the Maryland Food Bank um, since day one. Um, anything that's like moving out of the bakery um, that we're not able to use has gone to distribution centers around the city. So we just make that, that's been a priority since since COVID, we opened, I should also mention, we opened in June 2020 in the middle of the <laughs> COVID epidemic. Um, if you trace back three and a half years. Um, so we also have been basically donating up, you know, since since then, especially as uh, I think that the city and, and folks here were, were really needing help a bit of help. Um, and yeah, so that's we try to we try to move the bread, especially into into to basically toasted form and kind of dry it out and do different things like that. We use the freezer to kind of move it into different parts of the bakery um, over a period of time. Yeah. May I ask my other one? So this is a very loaded question. I'm a little nervous asking this, but I'm going to go ahead. So uh, it has to go with the affordability of good bread. Oh, sure. Bread. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the Soviet Union. I was born there when I was 16, we took them to Alaska. The whole premise, not the whole premise, but one of the slogans of the Russian Revolution in 1918 was is rich. Give us good bread and give us entertainment because that's what the people were lacking, right? Like there was a lack of like bread is considered, was considered like the substance for people like the essential, right? And I wonder, like if you go to the supermarket and you want to buy a good loaf of bread, if it's really pricey, right? Yeah. Versus not so good loaf of bread. My mother was visiting over the holiday break and she's from there. And she said, Well, you know, your bread's really different. I said, Well, mom, if I buy the bread you like, which is really, really affordable back then, like because it's like less than a dollar, maybe in the funeral, and it costs five, six, seven dollars, right? Yeah. For a good bread. So <clears throat> So my first fear of the question is maybe to our speaker, how affordable was bread in the 19th century? Like could a normal, you know, workers, family afford a good loaf of bread, right? The second tier is 
are there any subsidies? Like, can we make like good quality bread more affordable to the masses? Yeah, great, great question. Yeah. Um, so yes, um, bread was affordable. So these these um, uh, you know mom and pop shops were everywhere, and the labor costs were so low because the workers were so exploited that didn't keep wages. I mean, the, the actual like price of, of bread down. Um, there's an interesting study about bread and um, values, um, particularly how you could see values shifting in terms of the consumerism of bread. So during the 1930s, during the Depression, it became a status symbol if you could buy store-bought bread, even though the store-bought bread was, as you're saying, much less nutritious. Um, but if you were buying it as opposed to home baking, which was considered, you know, which was you know, more affordable, more nutritious, but didn't have the kind of status. And that continued even afterwards until there was a shift again in the 1980s, um, where if you had home-baked bread, it was considered a status symbol because you had were able to have like you know the um, you know a bread baking machine and you also had the time to do so. So there was a, a sociological study that really charted from the 1930s to the 1980s. So I don't know where it is now. I can only kind of speak to that how how things have shifted again. But I think that that is a really interesting question about about affordability, especially when as you're saying you treat your workers well, you know. So there's there how how do you? Yeah, that's um, that's been a major a major thought process for me. Again, I, I'm, a, I'm a farm kid, so I and I grew up in a, a relatively inex, inexpensive part of the country in central New York. Um, and so I, and I'm kind of a 90s kid, so I'm like, ah, oh, prices should be like this. You know, we shouldn't be spending more than this $5 on a sandwich. I'm like, I can't, afford, I could not afford that as a business owner. <laughs> and a lot of it comes down to labor. Um, the labor costs that go into, and as I mentioned, that our bread is staying longer, we'll call it on the table, instead of actually in the oven and, and into the into the market, um, that in order to get the, the bread flavoring and the bread type that we're looking for, um, I'm essentially having to have somebody clocked in working on that bread. Um, and, and it's all layers. So it's, it's there's, act, there's active moments with the bread, and then there's like, passive moments with the bread, but it's still being watched. And so we do a lot of layering of our, our baking process to try to offset. Um, at our bakery, we have an $18 internal minimum wage uh, for anybody that works there. So I think also we um, are, um, that's that's what I think is is fair. Um, that's for anybody that works there, but, but that also um, puts us into a, 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 a labor tier that I'm not, like run, running to a lower a lower hourly rate um, to try to offset um, labor costs that are going into that bread, for instance. So it's not really the ingredients necessarily that are driving it, it's, it's labor. Um, having said that, um, and being very sensitive to that, we have, um, I'm, I'm trying to keep as much of a um, uh, pricing tiering um, based purely on how long um, people are actually touching the dough. So we have bread loaves that are right now around 450, 475 for like a really nice, um, like an Italian, like rustic bread. Our batons are around 450, 475. Um, our baguettes, excuse me, our batons and baguettes are around 475. So we have things that are a little bit lower in cost. It may not be the volume of bread that um, we can get with a two pound loaf that's $7 at the moment. Um, but that is purely like reflecting, um, I think, how, how much time is going into each of these loaves. And so we, we, we value them because I'm watching all my employees like work literally all day on this bread. And so that's that's where it's, it's very interesting that a subsidy of some kind could actually assist in that um, if that is something that society is, is finding to be important. Um, going back, to, so you know, my wife is Turkish, and so again, the same thing happens in Turkey today, where um, bread is one of those things that people are very aware of. So when when prices go up in bread in Turkey, like it is a national conversation um, because it is so affordable for so many people, um, and that when those things price, it really shifts people's perspective in terms of how how they're going to survive. Like it's it's very interesting. We talk a lot about bread internationally as well as. In our own bakery, um, and it, it, a lot of it comes down to labor. Yeah, in the center. As a, a business owner and a baker, 
I know I realize that not everyone has the personality for baking. It's hard to find people who really have the interest and the uh stability, I guess. And I'm thinking of the, what you mentioned about there being journeymen and apprentice bakers and stuff like that. And I'm wondering, um, what is your training process? How do you juggle that with what you were just talking about, the labor costs and everything like that? Sure. That's that's a great question. So um, we we have um, gone back and forth between um, kind of hiring in incredibly experienced bakers um, to kind of like be ready, almost like ready to go. So that would be like a journeyman, maybe not a master baker, but a definitely like a germ, journeyman baker who's been working at this for quite some time um, to just make sure the machine is continuing to run and then essentially finding apprentices who can come in um, and and provide we provide them enough space um, to kind of learn on the fly. I I think that with our current our new larger facility, there's there's a lot more room for that that type of training. We we really honestly um, because we're so small, been relying a lot on, on experienced bakers to come in and, and help. Um, as we go forward, I don't think that we can totally only rely on that. And also, it's it's I passionate a really important aspect of this like if you if you don't know bread and you're like ready to go and you show like i'm going to be here and i'm going to show up on time i'm going to like do my work and i'm going to work quickly and i'm going to be paying attention to what we're working on and, and you sh you work towards improvement like that's equally as important as somebody who's coming in with, with 15 years of experience and like i know what i'm doing because like what they did in six other bakeries that they've worked in may not be how we're doing our sourdough bread. And that's one thing I've also learned is that, you know, just because you've worked in, in production bakeries before does not mean you know how to do a sourdough baking program. Those are, those are very different things. Um, we treat our dough very gently. Um, you know, commercial, commercial yeasted dough, uh, you can just throw around and like pull on. And it's like, I'm like, oh my God, we just spent five hours putting air into that loaf and you just literally knock the whole thing out. I'm like, okay, let's calm down. I'm just gentle. <laughs> gentle. Less is more. Less is more. And then so a lot of a lot of that learning process is understand it. Like we always talk about it, like have a conversation with the dough. And that's kind of weird to say. But like you know learn like learn how this dough is actually acting through its bulk fermentation. That's in this big bin and it's big vat of dough versus what it's gonna react, how it's gonna react to your hands when it's on the table and trying to shape it. Like these, um, the the kind of characteristics that we're looking for is a little bit of nerdiness, understanding, you know, understanding a little bit of understanding detail. Math is wonderful. Like I have a science mind and I, you know, I used to be a kind of a scientist. So like having kind of a nerdy science mind is always like a really good like starting point because that's kind of how that dough wants to react is like, you know, it does the same thing. If you change variables, then the bread will do something different. And you, if you understand that, then if that's that conversation that you're having with the bread. So those are kind of good characteristics to have. So your, your newcomers shadow. Yes, of course. Yes, our, our newcomers would in in most cases shadow me. Um, and so when when folks come in, I I try to train. Um, my my biggest regret right now is just not having a ton of. Um, time, prolonged period of time to to stay with new apprentices. And so what I've been doing is kind of starting people off and then kind of like, okay, you go talk to this person now, like, and we'll work with them for a little while and then I'll come back. And so, yeah, it's it's not really, it, with bread, it can't be a, uh, you know, like just throw you into the deep end and, and figure it out. Like it took, it took me like four years to even figure it out, like to a point where I was even comfortable be saying that I, I baked bread you know, it, it was a, it's a very humbling experience, but if you just try to, through trial and error, come up with a home-based, you know, baking program, so. Well, thank you. I'm so sorry. In the interest of time, we're going to have to end it here, but Keeler has graciously agreed to um, uh, be at the table with um, his, his samples, and I'd like to give him a round of applause. <laughs> I'll also see if the panel if you have any questions, but I, I would like to say also, um, you know, these programs, we have others coming up uh, with our work matters. Our next one, um, which is in uh, March, is on disruptive technology in the print industry. Um, and again, these are really made possible because of our members. 
So if you are a member, we thank you. Um, if you aren't a member but are interested in learning more, we have Mike Casey here as our director of membership. Yeah. <laughs> um, and again, thank you all for coming. And please stay after for, for some refreshments and hope to see you again next time.